Injection timing is another thing EFI can do much better than carbs. In this episode, I'm going to run through a little bit of an experiment and see how changing the injection timing affects my engine. Hi, my name's Aaron. I'm a DIY hobbyist tuner and car builder, and I can say I'm never going back to carbs again. The more I play with this EFI system, the more I see so many advantages that EFI has over carburetors. As mentioned in the prologue, we're looking at injector timing. Now that is, as what it names describes, we're timing the injection of the fuel. Uh, there are three modes you can use. Uh, is beginning of the time, the squirt, the middle of the squirt, and the end of the squirt. Uh, I've it seems logical to use the end of the squirt because you can say, I want all my fuel injected there because what happens with an engine, depending on the conditions, the pulse width that the injector is open for varies. Uh, so if you work from the beginning or the middle, you're going to have to, it, it, it's a lot more effort. So it just seems logical to stick with the, the end of the injection, uh, the pulse width there. Uh, but what it essentially, the difference between carbs is carbs use an orifice to create a vacuum situation to draw fuel into the airstream. It's normally droplets of fuel, not atomized, which uh, injectors primarily, they have a spray pattern and they can, depending on the injector, you can have a high quality atomization. Uh, but it, it, for every mass of air that goes through that orifice in a carburetor, equivalent amount of, well, a, a portion of fuel is drawn in. Uh, with injector timing, your injectors can be sized larger or depending on the situation, they don't need to be open all the time. So they can precisely deliver the portion of fuel you need associated with that engine condition at a very specific window. And that has a big, well, it, it at least appears to have a big effect on this en on, on your engine. And OEMs use different strategies to achieve different outcomes by changing when that injection actually occurs. So this project, um, it's, I thought I'd bust it up into a proper, inve uh, prop, uh, proper project with investigation, well, some, uh, like a list of goals, maybe a little bit of a, well, a review of available information, and then run through some testing and some results. So I've structured it that way. I have chapters in the description. Well, it should be chapters. You should be able to see them anyway uh, if you wanted to jump between bits and pieces. But first, we'll get into the project goals. So my project goals are pretty simple. Uh, my engine has always run a little bit rough, uh, maybe something to do with the camshaft profile, uh, I want to see if there's any optimizations to be had by the different injector timing angles, see if there's any influence and if there's anything to be had, if I can incorporate it into my tune somehow. You know, it's, this is simply just typing some numbers on a keyboard and it's very simple to adjust, which is another great thing why I think EFI is much better than carburetors. So uh, the the two, two main strategies, well, you've got CVI, which is closed valve injection, which is in relation to the intake inlet valve. Um, closed valve injection means the valve is closed. There's OVI, which is open valve injection, which is the opposite. The intake valve is open uh, when the injection occurs or part there open. So, but anyway, the engines always run a little bit rough with carbs or anything I've had on it. So if there's any opportunity to somehow stabilize that, uh, I'll certainly investigate that. And if there's any, again, if there's any efficiencies to be had, I'd like to discover those. Literature review was basically drawn from three resources. One being good old Google. The second being High Performance Academy Gold Level membership. Uh, I watch a lot of webinars. And if you're interested in tuning your own car recommend getting it as good return on investment and that white paper that <coughs> robbie forwarded me about the correlation between injection timing and lean burn mixtures uh, so summarizing up closed valve injection has a low volumetric efficiency uh, improved cold start emissions presumably because the valves heat up very quick as soon as the engine's running there's heat applied to the valve so there's opportunity to vaporize fuel and i think oems use that because euro emissions require your emissions to be under control very quick after the engine starts. So that's a strategy that OEMs use. And I think it might have something to do why cold starts on some cars seem to be quite aggressive because they might change the injection strategy. Uh, uh, with CVI, there's opportunity for the valve and the port wall to be wet, which, well, you got vaporization of the fuel mixture and also you got some cooling opportunity there. Uh, open valve injection is in cylinder cooling is, is possible because the fuel droplets are injected in the cylinder and can vaporize and vaporize in there whenever you get vaporization that's when en heat energy is absorbed to do that vaporization uh, you get improved stratification which is basically you get layers of different fuel mixtures within the cylinder and that can benefit because if from what i can gather if you get a, a rich environment around your spark plug where the kernel forms it start the fr flame front will start faster uh, you have reduced port, port wall wetting with OVI because it obviously it's getting injected in, doesn't have doesn't sit behind a closed valve for a very small period of time. Uh, you got faster transient response because 
it sounds like the fuel is in the cylinder when you need to be accelerating the engine. Uh, it normally has an increased emissions because those hydrocarbons that get sucked straight into the cylinder, they're, they're drop, depending on their droplet size, they may not burn fully, which means you may actually get raw hydrocarbons out the exhaust, which is a key thing for emissions. Uh, it certainly seems that OV, the performance of open valve injection is heavily governed by the atomization uh, efficiency of your injector. If it can't atomize the fuel well enough, then you're going to get larger droplets going in, which reduces the, the effectiveness of, of the combustion. Uh, the on that on the open valve injection uh, fuel the fuel droplet seems to it looks like there's a bit of shear going on when the air velocity drags the fuel droplets through uh, it seemed to be that when the fuel droplet size shears into smaller pieces when the fuel is injected later in the exhaust uh, the intake valve closing period so I don't know that must be just a strange outcome it seems to hack the little droplets down into something smaller. You may know this already, but leaner mixtures have a reduced combustion temperature, also flame propagation speeds, and the main combustion stage, which is where the injection, uh, the spark plug first fires, taking longer. Uh, with lean mixtures, in, there's a strategy to increase the ignition advance and spark duration to make sure that all that burning occurs before the exhaust valve opens up. Uh, with the overlap period, it causes cylinder to cylinder variations, and that's primarily due to the exhaust having an influence on the fuel being taken in. During that overlap period, both valves are open and there's opportunity for unburnt hydrocarbons to be sucked out the exhaust. And depending on your, on, on your exhaust setup, that can cause cycle to cycle variations, which makes things a little bit interesting. Uh, but that's, that's my literature review in a nutshell. So we can see three distinct areas being closed valve injection, the overlap period and open valve injection to, to be investigated. Sorry I lie, there is actually one more reference I'd like to make reference to, and that's Andy Whittle has a video where he runs through the different injection timing options and see how it affects his engine. I originally started out with just one test to, to investigate, but after I did the first test, I ended up doing a second test. Uh, the first test was just varying the injector timing with a fixed TPS, fixed VE, uh, which results in the same amount of fuel being injected all the time, and fixed ignition timing, and you just change where the injector cycle occurs. And this is influenced by Andy Weedle's video, how he actually goes through that process to identify where the peak RPM is, the peak, or the, just the RPM profile based on injector timing, as well as the MAP and the AFR. So that seemed like a good, good spot to start because what I'm using is an unloaded engine, essentially, uh, and using the change in RPM to measure torque because if, if torque increases, it, it can overcome uh, the internal frictions and just the losses within the engine and the RPM will rise. So that's what I'm using as my indicator for torque production. Okay, so this is the test bed. It's an L28, uh, bored and stroked. Uh, this is my intake manifold, which is uh, a Whitley tuned manifold. Uh, you can see it's been, well, it's very specifically designed. There's a neat cross section that shows the injector aligning with the valve. These injectors are Seaman Decker 446 CC ones, which have a spray cone of three to 13 degrees from memory. Uh, this is running uh, ran, ran by a Megasquirt computer, which the timing for injector timing works from the power stroke to the next point. Uh, it's not like some ECUs which try and estimate forward of the power stroke. Uh, I am running a distributor and a GT40 coil. The camshaft is a Crow Cams, it's 292 duration. Uh, what have I got? The uh, 495 thou lift at the valve. The, ex the intake opens at 40 degrees before top dead center, closes 72 degrees after bottom dead center. The exhaust is 510th hour lift at the valve. It's 296 duration. It opens at 776 degrees before bottom dead center and closes 40 degrees after top dead center. So that gives it an 80 degree overlap, which I will show in a little chart I've drawn just to demonstrate it. I don't know if you can see it, but the exhaust is a stainless steel Z3 race board header, which I don't know has anything to do with the outcome of the results. So this is my table of events. You can see I've got zero degrees top dead center, 360 degrees top dead center, and 720 degrees. So this is zero degrees top dead center at the past power stroke. This is the next power stroke, and you can see here, this is my estimate where the spark occurs. I've just roughed in my intake and exhaust valves. I don't know if that's where the peaks occur because uh, one, the cam card doesn't say that information, uh, and two, actually pointing out that I really don't know where my cam actually sits in relation to the crankshaft. Um, so the, I've just taken the cam card numbers here, but you can see uh, this is where the exhaust valve opens. It's bottom dead center. 
Uh, this is where the intake valve opens. This is where the exhaust valve closes, and you can see that's the 80 degrees overlap. That's bottom dead center um, on the intake stroke, and that's where the valve closes at uh, 72 degrees. Um, other things I did do was I used this little calculator at lmengines.com that determined based on your stroke and rod ratio and bore and all that bits and pieces it can actually use to estimate piston velocity but all I would use that for is to determine where my peak my highest piston velocity occurred and that appears to be 75 degrees after the top dead center of the stroke and that will occur going up as well as down um, so I've marked those in as well just in case that when I do the test if there's any correlation particularly about the observation that droplet size changes with velocity so at the moment mega squirt is set by default at the 360 degree mark so that's when it times the end of the squirt and it will start the squirt allowing for dead time and everything forward of that so the philosophy moving forward is get the engine up to temperature uh, uh, lock ignition lock tps lock the ve table so it's only injecting the same amount of fuel and just alter the injector timing along to from a start point to an end point and see what behavior we actually get. So bear with me, I've done the test, it was fairly laborious and I didn't want to bore you with just that whole test because it took maybe 20 minutes to go through all the items um, and that was just, you could, I don't think you could actually tell the difference unless you had the data. So I've just jumped through to the data I got here. I've got my Megalog viewer open, I've got my log. Uh, in this instance here, so referring to Andy Whittle's thing, I've just done the same, I'll have, I'll show the tables for uh, RPM, MAP and AFR. What we're looking at here is injector timing on the X axis and RPM on the Y. Now this is very interesting. So referring back to my little um, event chart here, uh, well there's this portion of data I deleted because the fan, electric fan actually turned off and that changed the load on the engine which to me it was the minor part of the data so I've just omitted that because it's not the same conditions as the rest so that's why there's a bit of a hole here. But so you can see this I got this from 0 through to 720 which also that's the same as my event chart. Uh, you can see here, well, well you can just see the spot, so this area is the closed valve injection, this here is the overlap period, and this here is the open valve injection. So you can see with really early closed valve injection there was quite a increase in torque, well RPM, so the taller the line in this graph here, the greater the variance. Uh, you can see once we get closer to bottom dead center of the um, exhaust stroke, or the sorry, the power stroke on the, and then the piston is returning to come back up. You can see there's a change in RPM. You've got this overlap period here where you can see it is quite variable, which is anticipated. And then we switch to open valve injection where the RPM is higher and um, the variance is a bit more stable. So just some statistics on this particular test. My TPS is at 1.1%. My VE was at 25. Oh, sorry, 24.5%, which yielded about a 2.7 millisecond pulse width on my injectors, of which 1.05 milliseconds was the dead time. The advance was locked at 15 degrees. Uh, funny enough, my intake air temperature, because I was just sitting here in the garage, not driving, the air coming off the hot extractors ended up being more than 50 degrees. So bear that in mind. Um, we already have a hot air charge coming in, which might make the variances less pronounced, I guess, because there's already from what I can gather, some improved vaporization already just by the hot air. <coughs> um, the tests were, I took it from 150 degrees through to 580, so this is past, the piston's already starting to come back up at this point here, ready for the spark to ignite the mixture. Now, moving along to map. So the x-axis is still the same, but uh, the y-axis is manifold absolute pressure, and you can see here during the um, closed valve event that the map has actually got the least amount of vacuum. So the lower the map value, because it's an absolute pressure, the higher the vacuum. The overlap period is pretty variable as expected, and then we get to the open valve injection, which actually produced the most vacuum. 
Uh, now moving to AFR, another similar, well, trend conforming to when the different invest, uh, the different types strategies there. Uh, you can see here early closed valve injection, it actually produced the lowest AFR. So that means because I'm injecting the same amount of fuel, that means less air is coming past the wide vent oxygen sensor, which means the combustion is more efficient. And that kind of goes in line with um, the theory that injecting onto a hot valve um, promotes better vaporization. And it is possible here that because this is still, be, the piston is still coming down on the power stroke, that there may be some residual heat within the cylinder. Well, the, the residual heat's probably higher on the back of the valve at this point, which is why there's this dip here, or this higher um, combustion efficiency here early on with the closed valve injection. You can see it comes back up a bit. Again, as expected, the overlap period is crazy variable, and then we get to open valve injection, which seems to steady itself out. So just jumping to the chart that uses RPM for the Y-axis, just to use the torque production as a, just to help me demonstrate my findings. Uh, early CVI showed lower RPM, uh, it had a higher map, and had the richest mixtures, which to me indicates it produces the lowest torque, the lowest vacuum, but also has the, it uses the most, the least fuel. The overlap period, it, this clearly demonstrates the claim that the cylinder to cylinder variance is influenced by the exhaust causes quite a lot of instability. Uh, I think I had my numbers here, got the RPM varied from 850 through to 1140 at 350 degrees injection. So I had previously tuned this car with the mega squirt default, which is 360. So you can see like that, that has a clear influence. I've been tuning in an area which might be less stable or there's other more stable areas which I could target. Uh, the AFRs varied from the leanest being 16.4 to the richest being 13.5 in the overlap area, and the map also varied the most. It was 10 kPa variance. Uh, jumping to the OVI, uh, it showed the state most stablest RPM. You can see um, the average variance was about 40 RPM, which is that I can see that has application for my motor because I'm, I'm one of my goals is to achieve a stable RPM. Uh, it had. Uh, a, a leaner, leaner average AFR being higher for the same amount of fuel, which goes in line to supports the the uh, hypotheses that uh, with open valve injection there is more hydrocarbons that get don't get burnt because they're not vaporized and come out the exhaust, which means see which which is indicated by this leaner mixture because the same amount of fuel is being injected. So if more air is coming out, well, thirteen point five units of air coming out for every one one bit of fuel going in. That means it's not burned as well. Uh, one thing I did note, well, I did in the background, and the results didn't all turn out well, so I'm not displaying them here, is I actually went through all the way up to about 700 degrees um, after the event, or after the power stroke from the previous event, and it showed very little difference. So I was asking it to inject the squirt actually when the spark plug was firing as the piston was coming up based on the 15, well, on 15 degrees fixed advance, and it didn't show any difference. So... <sighs> That, that shows that this open valve injection can be very stable for a long period of time. And that I guess that gives a bit of redundancy if you were to choose where to, it, it's a bit more forgiving. You have a larger opportunity to inject fuel with the same or very similar response from the engine. For me, my target, uh, emissions is not my focus because um, I'm only required to uh, comply with the Australian design rule for the time of manufacture. And just by simply putting EFI on this car, I would be, should be in theory leagues ahead of where the carburetors were uh, but depending on your philosophy you're applying to your engine you can see like essentially cvi will give you the least amount of fuel consumption uh over that period i don't think you'd ever use that for anything you would try to avoid that if possible and uh, um open valve injection certainly provides stability and i haven't tested tested transient response but if that is if that is true uh you get faster acceleration which might benefit my itbs uh, Another thing I did pick up on the research that I meant, didn't mention in the literature review is um, with that in-cylinder cooling with open valve injection, uh, there's the theory that exhaust gas temperatures will be less. To me, that means there's less heat being produced in the cylinder, which is not necessarily a bad thing because if the in-cylinder temperature is a little bit cooler, that would indicate that the knock threshold could be increased, which might give opportunity to, for more timing if your engine's knock limited. So after I completed that testing, I was intrigued a little bit more. So what I did do was sec carried out a second test where I picked two injector angles and attempted to vary the fuel supplied. So everything else was fixed, the TPS, the ignition timing, and then, well, the injector angle for the two instances. And what I did, I just 
very the AFR to see if I could actually get the same peak RPM or similar peak RPM, which indicates it is possible to achieve the same amount of torque with the different strategies, but I wanted to see what the fuel consumption was like. So the angles I picked were 280 degrees and 400 degrees. You can see, uh, this is the chart versus RPM. You can see that similar peak torque was, was possible. Um, lower, lower stable RPM was a bit funny, like this here is where it almost stalled. So um, the data there's probably not real relevant because I had to quickly adjust the fuel to bring it back to save it. So while it's not specific to what I was targeting in the investigation in the second test, I, this is my map profile. You can see with the 280 degrees, the map, I think these points of data here, which is where the map is only 25 kPa below atmospheric, uh, is, or 30 kPa is irrelevant because the engine might almost be on its way out stalling there. Uh, but you can see the, the map profiles I was able to achieve were, were fairly similar for both the, the 280, degree and the 400 uh, timing events. So just looking at the AFR, uh, AFR chart, you can see these are the two points. I was able to achieve, achieve very lean mixtures, um, not for long, uh, but with the closed valve injection, I was able to achieve a lower, richer mixture. Okay, so just again, jumping back to the RPM chart as a measure of torque to, to run through my findings. Uh, for the 280 degree, which essentially to me is closed valve injection, it achieved a peak of 1090 RPM at an AFR of 12.07. And that required a, f a volumetric efficiency fuel supply of 27%. Uh, the lowest stable RPM was 640, and that had an AFR of 19.5. For the 400 degree, which is open valve injection to me, I achieved a peak of 1,100 RPM, and that had an AFR of 12.95. It had a volumetric efficiency of 25%, so the open valve is already 2% less fuel to achieve the same torque. Uh, similar stable idle RPM uh, down to, well, yeah, as, the, as the 280 degrees, but it had an AFR of 18.5, so it was less, less, less efficient combustion at the, lo at the uh, lower RPM. So to me, this, uh, this indicates that torque could be achieved for each injector timing, but it would just require different amounts of fueling. So with that, you can see that the CVI could still achieve the same amount of torque as the OVI, but just required more fuel to do it. And that might have something to do with how that fuel vaporization theory works, injecting onto a closed hot valve. With any research uh, piece, it's always important to outline the possible errors. Uh, the first one being me, I might have introduced human error within here. Uh, and also I've built and tuned this engine myself. So there may be something that I've inherently included within those aspects that might affect the outcomes of this result. I've only completed really one test. so. To get good accurate data, you normally produce or undertake multiple tests to see if you can repeat the same uh, results. Uh, and I haven't done that. <coughs> um, I'm definitely not a professional. I'm just an enthusiastic DIY guy. So again, I'm, there might be some some feature or aspect that I've missed as part of this test or my tuning. One thing is, I don't know actually where my camshaft is in relation to my crankshaft. So my chart that I prepared was just basically idealized, correctly aligned to the cam card. So in reality, when I put this engine together, silly me, I didn't degree the camshaft. So uh, depending on where that camshaft actually is, that might have had an influence on the data that we reviewed. So I'm located at 660 meters above sea level, which means I'll have a reduced atmospheric pressure. I think it's about 93 kPa down from the 101. So I don't know if that has anything to do with any, has an influence on things. I'm also running 98 Ron uh, pump fuel, which I don't know if there's any inconsistencies that might have influenced the test. The last thing, getting back to how I built all this thing myself, I calibrated my, the sensors myself, so there may be an inherent error in the calibration. So just a summary of the results, I can definitely see the difference between closed valve overlap, overlap and open valve injection strategies. Uh, I can see where fuel is less consumed with, or less fuel is required for CVI, but again, it, it lacks the torque and the map. I can see how my particular setup favors open valve injection, and I think that's just an inherent design property with the manifold. So uh, I see avenues to per pursue pursue open valve injection theory or philosophy with, with my particular tune. The most common advice I saw how to find the best injection timing for your engine was actually get on a dyno, fix the, do, get it to a steady state and vary the injection angle uh, to get the most torque. Now just looking at my charts, um, that's likely that you might get that, that, that's well and good, but looking at my charts, you probably end up, if you just base it on the peak RPM, you'll probably end up somewhere in the overlap period, uh, which is may not address all your problems. For me, if I was to use overlap period as, for the maximum RPM as an indicator of maximum torque, 
I would have quite a varying RPM. And for me, I think focusing on an open valve strategy, which ultimately has a more stable, but maybe a little bit less torque, um, a stable RPM, idle and whatnot, and many other benefits, I think there's value in that. And I don't think if you were to chuck it on a dyno and just reviewed the maximum torque that you'd actually be able to see that, um, which is why I think it's important to, well, this test is one of the reasons why I did this test was to actually see what uh, outside just targeting peak torque would actually produce. Having said that my manifold appears to favor open valve injection, I can see use for closed valve injection, particularly with the cooling aspects of spraying into the port and the closed valve. Uh, it's a common strategy, which I picked up from HPA again. There's areas of, I'm running an alpha N, not a uh, speed density diagram, so that means my throttle position governs my fueling. Uh, there are parts of that VE table which are generally termed unused or will not naturally be reached uh, under normal driving conditions. Uh, I do see opportunity though, um, in some of those regions you'll pass through, like if you're in a race conditions, you're wide open throttle, you change gear, it comes back down and then it heads back up to wide open throttle when you stamp on the throttle. There's this region which will be accessed during that period, which you, there is a theory that you, you try and cool the engine a bit as well as try and get a some fuel ready for when you actually do stand on the accelerator to, to, to so you don't have any uh, lag or reduce lag. Uh, so I can see value in changing where that area where you access between gear changes under wide open throttle using a closed valve injection strategy to get fuel in there to cool bits and pieces down before you tromp on the accelerator again. So for me, I can see value in incorporating closed valve injection into my tune that way. So just remember I'm a DIY enthusiast hobbyist kind of guy. If you're watching this and you know the answer to some things or I've done something wrong, uh, leave me a comment. Uh, I certainly don't want to be feeding the community incorrect information. Um, and particularly if you've got some clarity on some of the items, yeah, leave a comment. Uh, got any questions? Leave a comment. If you like this video, appreciate a like. Uh, and if you're watching this for the first time, consider subscribing. Uh, my last thanks goes out to my Patreon supporters who I really do appreciate. Those guys uh, certainly help me uh, produce this kind of content. And if you're interested in becoming a Patreon supporter, I'll have a link to my Patreon page in the description. All right, guys, that's it from me. I'll talk to you later. Bye.